Netflix. January 11th, 2001. Famed Brazilian actress, model, and singer Xuxa lands her prop spaceship on the stage of a Brazilian TV Dude, look set at and begins her show the way she always does. The program, titled Xuxa Park, was a hit for the Ready Global Network, targeting a demographic of young children with its over-the-top dance numbers, fun games, and immersive futuristic sets. Premiering back in the summer of 94, Shusha Park had shown little signs of slowing down by the turn of the okay, century so this is a show for and kids. seemed poised for a long, impressive run, barring any unforeseen disaster. On this particular day, 300 children were in attendance to watch or participate in the show's activities. Shusha's infectious energy led the way from segment to segment as they played games, showed cartoons, and of course, sang their songs. And by the Do you guys remember that show called Wild and Crazy Kids? It was literally a show where you watched other kids have fun. <laughs> but when I was a kid, I didn't realize that I was like watching other kids have fun <laughs> instead of just having fun myself. At the end of the episode, the crew had all gathered on stage to perform one last musical number to end things off with a bang. And evidently, that's exactly what would happen. This frame was taken just over one minute later, revealing all that remained of the set, as within that impossibly short window of time, the once bright and inviting scenery was turned to a pitch black, unrecognizable hellscape, barely comprehensible to the camera that was also just mere moments away from being swallowed by the flames. But not before it would capture the carnage firsthand. What the? <laughs> What the f happened? In the blink of an eye, the spaceship which Shusha had rode in on and was moments away from re entering to leave the set would catch fire all while the dancers continued their performance, unaware of the emerging danger behind them. A member of the staff quickly enters the frame in an attempt to extinguish the flames, but it was already too late. As just a few seconds after the spark, the entire ship was engulfed by the blaze, causing a mass panic on the set. Worst of all, directly next to the fiery ship, and just barely out of view of the camera, was the show's signature Ferris wheel, which kids would ride during the program, including during this very moment. As the Bruh. fire raged, one boy was trapped in his seat, helpless to the danger unfolding around him. And noticing this, a group of brave people on scene began Holy desperately trying shit. to free him, which can just barely be seen on the left-hand side of the screen. Thankfully, their attempts proved successful, as he was eventually freed from his seat and carried to safety. The fire was later determined to have started by an electrical short circuit, and the set would soon be completely turned to ash and rubble. But as for the nearly 300 children and numerous staff on scene, despite multiple injuries, everyone had somehow managed to escape the building with their lives. Okay. With the only reported fatality okay. being the show itself, as this would be the last episode ever filmed, with Shusha Park being swiftly cancelled. Wow. Thankfully, this moment saw all parties involved survive the ordeal, a rarity in the world of disturbing television moments though it does highlight just how quickly things can go downhill. There was a shit ton of people there. I've never heard of this. When the cameras are rolling, and when these dark moments ultimately happen, all we can really do is watch. Something happened that turned this video into a horror movie. I mean, you know, like, like, like real talk, yeah, it sucks that it happened, but it did have a good ending at least. Dude, that could have been a death trap. Water right now. Your three-year-old daughter is what? The Akins. Like the concert one. There's, there's like one lesson you can learn from my channel. It's that there's a couple concert ones. 
The internet can be a dark and unforgiving place, and unfortunately, it's become all too easy for data brokers to find our personal information, like our full legal names, personal emails, home addresses, and even our relatives. And as someone who has been personally affected by the availability of this information, which has caused me a great deal of anxiety, I'm very excited to tell you about today's sponsor, Yo, today's Aura, sponsor, a company Aura. dedicated to helping our You guys know about Aura? Here, use yeah, the code. This sounds like something you may Aura. be interested com. in. You can use my link, aura.com Nick Crowley. Nick Crowley to get a 14-day free trial sorry, sorry, and see sorry. if your personal information has been leaked online. Buried. There are very few manners of death that strike fear among us as much as the horrifying prospect of being buried alive. The dark, claustrophobic nature of it, slowly losing oxygen with not a thing in the world you can do to stop it. Oh man, have you seen this movie? It's a movie you watch once and never again, but I thought it was pretty good. It's, it just strikes a chilling chord with so many. Ryan Reynolds. However, with this you didn't fear like it. arose a unique op you didn't like it. opportunity I thought it was pretty for good. those looking to make a spectacle. Rather than running from this mortal fear, a select few magicians and daredevils have tried their hand at the challenge of being buried alive by not just surviving, but escaping. The trick was popularized by arguably the greatest magician of all time, Harry Houdini, oh, who tried his hand at the stunt on a few separate occasions. Houdini was crazy. The first of which would see him narrowly escape a casket, buried- Dude, you know people still don't know how he did some of his tricks? Dude, this guy was so next level. I find some of these magicians very fascinating. I under six feet of dirt. I think it's just very interesting. It's very interesting. By breaking through the first of all time, Harry Houdini, who tried his hand at the stunt on a few separate occasions, the first of which would see him narrowly escape a casket buried under six feet of dirt by breaking through the surface with his fist, only to fall unconscious before he could complete the trick, with the stunt Holy almost shit. ending in his death. Okay, I never heard about From that there, one. From there, he would be buried again on two separate occasions, Bro. surviving both for well over an hour, but never being able to fully pull himself out, and in turn pull off the seemingly impossible. Houdini did have plans to give it one more try in 1927, when he believed the stunt would finally be completed, but sadly he would pass away before getting the opportunity. Because of this, the trick has acted as somewhat of a magnum opus for any magician able to pull off the feat, a feat that even the great Houdini himself couldn't accomplish. And so, on the 66th anniversary of his death, American escape artist Bill Shirk would honor the late magician by attempting to do just that. Oh God, For the stunt, die. Shirk would add extra elements of flair, upping the danger by being handcuffed and having cement poured over top of the casket as opposed to just dirt. And he planned on doing it all with a TV crew on hand. However, from the get-go, things seemed to be off with the performance, as Shirk expressed concern over the grave being dug too wide and too long, thus changing the dynamics of his escape. I hope I'll make this. Oh, no, I got a bad feeling about this thing. At one point, when the first layer of dirt was being applied, Shirk would use his walkie-talkie to tell his team to call off the whole ordeal and to pull him up from the ground, seemingly in a moment of clarity. But everything was already in motion. This was his big moment with everyone watching. He couldn't afford to fail. Besides, he had been buried alive before, setting a record back in 1977 by spending a total of 79 hours beneath the surface of the earth. He was no stranger to this, and... 79 hours. Is anybody else thinking what I'm thinking? Where did he go to the bathroom? Not wanting to let his Yo, hey dragons, thanks for the resub. Fans down. Bill Shirk would change his mind and continue the stunt by giving his team the green light to begin pouring the cement. And as that concrete began to settle and harden over top of the casket, things take a very grim turn. Decides to go ahead. I think we gotta go. Tons of concrete are poured. Suddenly, the concrete sinks. The coffin has been crushed. Almost immediately, the level of liquid concrete dips dramatically, and Holy large bubbles appear on the surface, shit. accompanied by a massive splashing noise. Signs that point to only one real possibility, that the weight of the concrete and dirt had caused the coffin to cave in, with those very same materials instantly filling in any available space inside the coffin, and in turn, suffocating Shirk. The rescue effort was underway almost instantly, but still, oh, it felt like late. it was all moving in slow motion. Way too most late. Most assumed right away that if the weight of the concrete alone had not killed him, then the lack of oxygen certainly would. A backhoe digs, and digs, and crucial moments pass. 
Shirk cannot be found. However, this thankfully wouldn't be the case. Holy Incredibly, shit. Incredibly, Shirk managed to claw his way to the surface, where his team was able to pull him to safety and rush him into an awaiting ambulance. What And though his condition appear, he was alive and had somehow cheated death. Thank, thank God he spared my life on this one and uh, it'll be a while before I'll do one of these, I'll tell you that. Despite claiming to be done with his stunt for a while, Shirk would be back to attempting his death-defying stunts soon after, with some ending in similar results. People are gonna live their lives how they're gonna live their lives. You cannot feel sorry for these people when they die, especially like people like him. I'm not trying to sound cold, but what do you expect? You put yourself like in a literal death trap and you make it out and then you do it again and you make it out. I feel like at that point, it just becomes like an addiction. I'm just not gonna feel sorry for a person that is gonna put themselves in harm's way on purpose and then dies. To me, that is stupid. But look, man, I try to be as absolutely respectful as I can about how other people live their lives and how they spend their money and you know, it's none of my business, right? But situations like this, I would never do this. After Shirk climbs in the casket, the snake goes in first, but there's a problem and Shirk has to get help. But although Bill Shirk was able to Just look at the situation. Done soon after, with some ending in similar results. After Shirk climbs in the casket, the snake goes in first, but there's a problem, and Shirk has to get help. But although Bill Shirk was able to escape this trick with his life, not everyone has been so lucky. Two years prior to this guy is an idiot. Shirk's run in with death, another performer known as the Amazing Joe had attempted the same stunt at an amusement park, also going the route of having dirt and wet cement poured over his plastic and glass coffin. This was Joe's attempt at becoming a master escape artist and forever etching himself into the history books of this particular niche. In fact, he had already done what Houdini couldn't, as years prior he had escaped from a wooden coffin covered in six feet of dirt. But this attempt was clearly much more extreme, and with it should Yo, have Rex, come an immense amount of planning, not only by Joe himself, but the team around him. However, according to reports, the coffin used was never actually tested to see if it could withstand such a great amount of weight. And also, he never tested the weight of the cement itself and the speed in which it would harden. Joe was quite literally going into this blind, and his confidence was apparent, as the cherry on top of this poor planning was the fact that no rescue procedure was in place should the stunt go horribly wrong. And unsurprisingly, well, that's exactly what would happen. He's an idiot, man. It was a cold night anyway, but, and when it sunk, I just knew trouble. We're in trouble. And it's not fun anymore. Much like the footage from Bill Shirk's attempted escape, the level of cement and dirt suddenly dips, only this time in a much more dramatic fashion, with the cave-in being so brutal that I'm not sure I'll even be allowed to show it on YouTube. According to many onlookers Holy there, the cave being destroyed by that immense weight caused a massive crashing noise, followed by immense panic from those trying to rescue Joe. But without a proper plan, the situation quickly grew helpless. And trapped beneath that dirt, surrounded by cheering fans, his parents, and a TV camera, the amazing Joe would lose his life. Ironically, like, I don't even feel sorry for this guy. Why would you do that? Likely within a coffin, buried six feet under. Shannon Stone. Sporting events are no stranger to disturbing TV moments, from hockey players having their throats cut open, well, folks, this is ugly. Richard Zedek holy is shit, wide open. to a football player suffering cardiac arrest right there on the field. They have been administering CPR through these past two breaks that we've taken. It's unfortunately oh always a risk in practically any televised sport out there. And although there's always a lingering chance that at any moment, things could go terribly wrong, that risk mainly pertains to the players actually participating in the sport, and you likely wouldn't imagine fans being in any sort of danger as they sit by watching the game. Though sadly, it does happen from time to time, with perhaps the most notable example being the story no, of Shannon Stone. Shannon was a 39-year-old firefighter who, on the 7th of July, 2011, took his son Cooper- 
Dude, my dad was a fireman. Uh, he's retired now, but my dad was a fireman for like 35 or 40 years or some shit. Let me tell you, those mother are heroes, man. Real talk. To watch a Texas Rangers game in Arlington, this was the perfect bonding opportunity for the duo and an even better- Man, as a fireman, man, you gotta be a paramedic too. You gotta know all that shit. Better opportunity to catch fly balls as their seats left them in prime position to take home an unforgettable souvenir. The two would even stop at a sporting store beforehand where Shannon would buy his son a baseball glove to use in the event that a loose ball came flying their way. And as the game reached the top of the second inning, their moment had finally arrived. A foul ball was hit in their general direction, being quickly recovered by Rangers outfielder Josh Hamilton. And rather than returning the ball to the dugout or the field itself, Hamilton decided to make Cooper's day, recognizing the young fan in the stands and subsequently tossing the ball to Shannon. As this was all transpiring, the game continued with the pitcher preparing for his next throw, before suddenly, you can hear the sound of something strange. I want them to be great in their last <laughs> Actually, I'd rather have that than have it like Holland where he just knocked off. It almost seemed like yelling, which was followed by some sort of strong reaction from the crowd, which in turn led to an immediate stoppage of play as the announcers were left trying to figure out what exactly was happening until they finally received word on the unfolding situation. He's got, got a lot of energy built up. I think somebody fell out of the stands in left field trying to uh, feel the baseball got. Well, this is it. That's why there was time taken. Wow. The man in this footage was in fact Shannon Stone, and as Josh Hamilton had gone to toss the ball up to him, the throw fell just a bit short, causing the 39-year-old father to extend past the railing before losing his balance. And despite the seemingly playful nature of the announcers at the time, You were right, Ray. Somebody did tumble. <laughs> This fall was no laughing matter, as below that railing stood a 20-foot fall directly onto a concrete floor, which Shannon would strike head first. Oh my god. As he laid there god. on the ground, barely able to move, the man was miraculously still conscious, finding the strength to tell the rescue team carrying him out, please check on my son. My son was up there all by himself. Based on this reaction, it was clear that Stone was obviously alive and had clear brain function, making his initial prognosis on the scene somewhat promising. But before he would even reach a nearby hospital, Shannon Stone would be pronounced dead. Holy According fuck. to many medical professionals, this immediate showing of brain function was more or less a fluke occurrence, and something they call a lucid interval which is a window of conscious clarity after a traumatic injury, essentially meaning that although his ability to move and speak seemed to be a positive indicator, it was instead a sign that the injuries his brain had suffered were going to be fatal. In the years since, Shannon Stone's memory lives on Holy with a statue shit. being made in his honor in that very stadium where his life came to an end, forever immortalizing someone who, by all accounts, was a great man and an man, even that's better sad. father. Damn. We don't see or hear it was just a really, really bad accident. The end of To Catch a Predator. If you spent predator. any considerable amount of YouTube, then chances are you're at least somewhat familiar with the show To Catch a Predator. During its run oh, on Dateline, yeah. the show wasn't- Dude, this show is insane, man. Yeah, Chris Hansen. <laughs> Chris Hansen, dude. During its run on Dateline, the show was incredibly popular, with its host Chris Hansen being launched into stardom for his role exposing <laughs> on the internet. How you doing? All right, I'm gonna have a seat over in that chair, please. At the time, there was really nothing else like this on TV and was widely viewed as one of the most entertaining shows out there. Dude, this shit was real too, by the way. These guys like went to jail and shit, man. Did you guys watch this back in the day? I watched this shit, dude. Which has caused it to find a second life here <sighs> on YouTube as re-uploads of its episodes have been viewed as many as 50 million plus times. To this day, the show remains- What the f and during its television run, the same was true, which led me to wonder how or why it was ever taken off the air. I mean, it was entertaining, popular, and with the internet exploding in recent years, the content would seemingly be endless. Yet somehow, this show only lasted three years. And that's when I realized okay. that there's actually a very specific reason why To Catch a Predator was pulled from the air. And it's one of the darker TV stories mm -hmm. I've ever heard. 
During the fall of 2007, Perverted Justice, the team that To Catch a Predator used to find their predators, had set up a decoy account on MySpace, posing as a 13-year-old boy. Oh, God. Okay, this is how old this show is, dude. MySpace. And before long, another user had taken the bait, reaching out to the fake child in the hopes of sparking an intimate relationship. According to the user's account, he was a 19-year-old college student that happened to live in the same area. However, upon doing some light digging, the perverted justice team discovered that the man was actually in his late 50s. His name was Louis Kondrat, and although his behavior was similar to essentially all other predators in the show's run, sending explicit messages and pornographic images, despite knowing he was speaking to a child, Louis was different in- The internet was a mistake on so many different levels, man. In one respect. It seems that Kondrat was in a position of power, working as a chief felony assistant district attorney for Rockwall County. This was setting up to be To Catch a Predator's biggest catch to date, and exposing him would not only mean bringing him to justice, but also bringing in great ratings for the show. Though yeah, two for one. one. Major issue, upon engaging the decoy for a few hours and even calling to speak to him. Hello? Hey, Will. Hey, what are you doing? Nothing. What are you doing? Nothing. No? No, I was looking up to see how to get to where you are. Still thinking about me? Yeah, where's your right hand? Um, it's in my pocket. Whoa. In your pocket? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what are you doing with your right hand? Dude, this is so creepy, dude. In your pocket. Lewis stopped responding and seemed to recognize the grave error he was making and began deleting all content from his account. And as a few days passed, it was clear that Lewis was not going to be visiting their sting house, which meant no program and no justice. However, the To Catch a Predator oh. team was not. A few days passed, it was clear that Lewis was not going to be visiting their sting house, which meant no program and no justice. However, the To Catch a Predator team was not going to let this go easily, with the crew coming up with a plan that had never been done before in the history of the show. They were going to bring the program to Kondrat. And so on November 5th, Hansen and his crew would visit Kondrat's house with a group of officers and an arrest and search warrant. This would not be without controversy though, as the warrants supposedly contained wrong information like the wrong county and the wrong date, meaning that they would likely struggle to hold up in court and probably should have never been acted on. Despite this, the crew urged law enforcement to act anyway, rushing the ordeal to assure they got their guy. And so, the police agreed, first calling Kondrat and then knocking on his door for multiple hours, though neither attempt saw any results. Holy and growing shit. growing impatient with the whole ordeal, they then called in the SWAT team to surround and eventually breach the house, which they would do around 3 p.m., barging into the home and surrounding Kondrat at gunpoint. As this was all happening, To Catch a Predator had their cameras trained on the outside of the home, awaiting the shot of Kondrat being ushered into a cop car and driven away. Unaware that this time, things were going to end much differently. Inside, Kondrat would yell to the officers, I'm not going to hurt anybody, before brandishing his pistol. And rather than pointing it at the officers, he instead pointed it at himself. The officers line up in formation and head to the back of the house. Then we hear a faint crack. The officers force their way in. For almost five minutes, we don't see or hear anything. Then Lieutenant Adina Barber of the Murphy Police Department comes out and tells us what happened. As they made entry, they confronted the suspect. I believe he's in the hallway, and he told them he wasn't going to hurt them. And then and he had a pistol. Yeah, he himself. This single gunshot would essentially mark the end of To Catch a Predator, as in the time following. NBC would be hit with a $105 yeah. million lawsuit from Kondrat's own sister. And though this lawsuit was settled privately with undisclosed conditions, the show was already on death's door, which was not helped by the national media dogpiling on To Catch a Predator as well as perverted justice. But now there are serious questions about what goes on. Okay, okay, okay. This is what I wanted to say earlier. This particular like case or whatever, man, is ex you have like extremely mixed feelings because okay, me, I don't value every human's life. I think that some people don't deserve the life that they have. I think that this world would be better without certain individuals. However, the show, they don't care about what he did. 
They don't care about the reasons that they should care about. All that show did was care about the ratings. They just cared about the money. So on one hand, like I personally am glad that this person can't do this anymore. But on the other hand, the other side crossed that line. Their original goal, their original purpose was to expose these people. So once they found out that they couldn't expose them, the original intent of the show came out. The original intent of the show was never about exposing these people, which is kind of pathetic. It was about the ratings. This situation is just shit all around. Behind the scenes. Whose sting was this? The police departments or the vigilantes hired by Dateline? You don't have the full transcripts? I don't know. That's exactly part of my problem. The police department can't tell me whether or not I have the full transcripts. Did your arresting officers, did they see the chats before they made the arrest? In some cases, yes. Did they see the entire chance? Making it impossible, says District Attorney Roach, to mount a successful prosecution. Charges have been dropped against every single person arrested in the Murphy Sting. Ooh, I actually didn't think about that. They actually tarnished their own name because now that this show actually showed that it was like, you know, disingenuous and shit and they went and they and the way that they handled that. Now you have to question how they handled other things, too. But these claims causing some to believe that the show was more interested in entertainment rather no, 100 percent than justice, and whether that's true or not, to catch a predator would be canceled, marking a tragic end to one of the strangest, yet most compelling TV shows ever to be broadcast, thanks solely to this grim moment. Like, I used to watch this back in the day, and it was very entertaining. <laughs> <clears throat> As evident by the first batch of cases in this video, many of the darkest moments in TV history come from shocking accidents or overall disturbing events that play out for the cameras to see. However, there are a select few examples where television moments only really become dark long after they're aired and more context is given. For example, in our first installment of the series, we discussed Renard Spivey. Ask him he's been married for how long? Oh, look at him though, he look mad. <laughs> <laughs> he don't look 63-year-old <laughs> Renard Spivey accused of killing his wife, 52 year What the f Old Patricia Spivey after an argument that turned deadly. The man who had murdered his wife years after making an appearance on television, with one joke at his expense during this time aging like milk. The concept of killers finding their way onto TV is one that I've recently become fascinated by, with the case always being brought up in tandem with this conversation being the dating game killer. In 1978, a man named Rodney Alcala had found his way onto the popular show The Dating Game, earning a date with Cheryl Bradshaw above all other contestants. However, this date would never actually materialize, as upon meeting him away from the cameras, Cheryl found the man to be creepy and ultimately declined to speak with him any further. And as it turns out, that decision may have saved her life. During the time in which this episode was shot and aired, Rodney was in the midst of a massive killing spree, ending the lives of at least eight people that we know of, though many claim his true number of victims is shockingly closer to 130 due to the fact that they had found- 130? What? of victims is shockingly closer to 130. Do you guys know how crazy that is? Those like really famous serial killers? Like uh, Gacy killed like 37? Dahmer killed like 30? Ted Bundy killed like 33 or some shit? This guy killed 130? I've never heard of this guy. Due to the fact that they had found a stash of over 1,000 photographs detailing women- I mean, yeah, that's true. That That's just the ones they admitted, right? Yeah. 30, due to the fact that they had found a stash of over 1,000 photographs detailing women, young boys, and men that Rodney had taken, many of which are believed to have been unidentified victims of him. And what makes this all the more chilling is the fact that Rodney had told the show that he was a photographer, and it was even mentioned during the program. Now let's see, Baxter number one is a successful photographer who got his start when his father found him in the dark room at the age of 13, fully developed. Given the shocking nature of this case, it's really no wonder why it's become so popular, especially here on YouTube. I've never heard of but this surprisingly, guy. there are quite a few examples of killers finding their way onto our TV screens that have happened within the past decade alone. 
and one that even happened within just days of writing this script. One obscure example comes from the show Celebrity MasterChef, where in the background, we can see an inconspicuous man serving food cooked by the contestants of the show. The man was one of a dozen unnamed chefs, just helping out typically out of view of the camera. But for this one split second, and likely to the recognition of no one, we see him. This man's name is Stephen Port, a 40-year-old living in South London, who has since come to be known as the Grinder Killer. Stephen is responsible for the deaths of four men he met on the Grinder app, all of whom he had lured to his flat and poisoned. What the f is Grinder? Is that like a dating site or something? A oh, gay tender? With fatal doses of GHB, before going on to violate and then dump their corpses. With these murders transpiring not long after this fleeting moment was broadcast for the world to see making me wonder just how many other killers have appeared in glimpses on TV that have not yet been recognized. Maybe they were walking in a crowd or panned over at a sporting event, hiding in plain sight. But killers don't just get shown as background characters. Oh, shut the f up. Jesus Christ. Sure, it's you you don't know. Sure. Or as one-off contestants for just a single episode, sometimes they are permanently etched in the show's history. In the summer of 2020, Food Network began airing a season of Worst Cooks in America, one of their more popular shows. And this one was set to be a big one, as it marked the program's 20th season. Yo, you guys like Chopped? Oh man, I love Chopped, dude. I love food shows. The competition was all in good fun with lots of hu I always get hungry too, whenever I watch Chopped, dude. Humorous and memorable moments, leading to the eventual finale on the 2nd of July. And in that episode, the fan favorite Ariel Robinson would take home the crown as winner of the show, along with a grand prize of $25,000. However, if you were to look for this money. season today, let's say on demand, on streaming services, or even on TV, you would be left with no results, as its existence has been practically wiped from the face of the earth. And given what happened after the season ended, this comes as little surprise. Upon winning the competition, Ariel Robinson settled back into her normal life with her husband, Jerry. And after securing life-changing funds from the show, the couple made the admirable decision to foster a young girl named Victoria, whom they eventually decided to officially adopt in January of 2021. On the 6th of the month, just over a week before the adoption was set to be finalized, Ariel would take to Twitter to boast about her parenting, stating, I'm a mama bear and I'll do anything to protect my children and make sure their futures are equally bright. A statement that seemed in line with her already stellar reputation as being a fun-loving, good person who dedicated her life to loving her kids. However, no one could have imagined the devastating turn this family was heading for. Five days after Victoria's adoption, Ariel's husband, Jerry, would dial 911, stating, You have an emergency. Our daughter is um, not is unresponsive. She's drunk a lot of water. We're trying to pump like She's already getting out. Our three-year-old daughter is choking on water right now. Your three-year-old daughter is what? Choking on water right now. We need help immediately. Okay. Choking okay. on water? water? This led to emergency responders rushing to the scene where the young girl was found unresponsive on the floor of her bedroom and was soon after declared dead. Across her body, what? There were countless bruises which Ariel claimed to have been from their attempts at CPR. Though bizarrely, during the whole ordeal, her story would quickly change as she soon began blaming her seven-year-old son, whom she stated had a history of anger issues, believing potentially he had killed her. Already, something very strange was happening with the situation, and it only became Dude, more bizarre so when sad, a forensic man. pathologist confirmed that Victoria had died not from choking, but from blunt force injuries and internal bleeding, essentially meaning that her death was no accident. This launched a full-scale investigation into the couple, where it would later be discovered that on the day before her death, Victoria had gotten sick at church, causing Ariel to undress her and make her walk out of the building in just her underwear, telling her, Oh, you're cold. You're cold. Girls that make themselves throw up deserve to be cold. What? This anger the seemingly the next morning, where, ironically, Victoria was refusing to eat pancakes that Ariel had cooked, which led to Ariel grabbing her. Remember how I said that not everyone deserves the life that they have? Yeah. This is why, dude. This is why I don't value all human life, because of shit like this, man. Dragging her up the stairs and beating her with a paddle. According to Jerry, who was working in the backyard at the time, he could hear the beating from outside, claiming that it lasted almost an hour, though he did nothing to stop it. 
and as a result, Victoria began to bleed internally and later would pass away due to the traumatic injury she had suffered by the hands of her soon-to-be mother. When it was all said and done, Ariel Robinson was arrested and will now spend the rest of her life in prison. So this doesn't like, I'm not gonna say it doesn't matter, like the life sentence doesn't matter, right? I guess what I'm trying to say is that there's nothing that can be done to, I guess, punish this individual for what they did. Man. So soon after her triumphant win on Worst Cooks, since the news initially broke on this, the entirety of season 20 has been removed from the internet and has been wiped from the show's history. But for me, one of the most chilling moments in Ariel's history on television came soon after her victory, when a local news station would come to her home for an interview. But now I truly am not the worst cook in America. But she is the winner of Food Network's Worst Cooks in America Season 20. Yes, I am putting mayo in a glove. Ariel Robinson lives in Simpsonville. We're inside. We see a sign proudly displayed by Ariel, touting her as the number one so, so he said that she had two other kids. So she had two kids and she adopted a kid. She basically adopted the kid just to abuse and then murder them. And she tried to pin the blame on one of them. There's not a word that I can think of. I mean, I'm stupid, so maybe there is, but there's not a word I can think of that is more powerful than like vile or trash or just worthless. There's not a word that can express how much I really hate these people, man. Mom. Soon after, the same local news station would become the leading reporters on her murder case. Despite this all transpiring within just a few years, this surprise- Another crazy thing is that none of this had to happen. This was purposely done. And just when you think about it, man, it just makes me hate these people even more. All of this could be prevented, or could have been prevented, but this person chose not to. Surprisingly is not even the most recent example of a killer being prominently featured on TV, as news broke of this final example just days ago. In January of 2020, the widely popular show Family Feud featured the Bleefnik family, who would go on to win the episode and leave a few iconic moments in its wake, with the most relevant coming from this man, Timothy Bleefnik. During one of the segments, the question was posed, what is your biggest mistake you made at your wedding? To which Timothy responds with, Honey, I love you, but said I do. <laughs> question was posed, what is your biggest mistake you made at your wedding? To which Timothy responds with, Honey, I love you, but said I do. <laughs> Not my mistake. Not my mistake. I love my wife. <laughs> I'm gonna get in trouble for that, aren't I? Yeah. <laughs> if you've seen the show before, you know that this type of humor is the norm, and jokes like this are made in virtually every single episode. I feel like he hates his job. <laughs> I feel like Steve really hates his job, bro. Look at this, dude. <laughs> episode but this one would later take on a much more sinister tone due to the events that unfolded not long after the show Me had aired. No, I haven't. Around a year after Timothy's I've moment in the limelight, it, he and his wife Rebecca would actually separate, not officially divorcing, but living in separate homes and seemingly not getting along either, as it was recently revealed that Rebecca had filed for a restraining order against both Timothy as well as his father a clear indication that she believed her life was in some sort of danger. Yeah. Fast forward to February of 2023, and the two were finally making headway on finalizing an official divorce, before on the 23rd day of the month, gunshots rang out from Rebecca's home. Police say 41-year-old Rebecca Bleefnik was found by a family member Thursday. Police say she had been shot multiple times. When police arrived on scene, Rebecca was sadly no longer alive and it wouldn't take long for investigators to turn their sights on Timothy. On March 13th, police would arrest the now 39-year-old in connection- I bet you he killed her over money because she wanted to divorce him and she was gonna get half of his shit. And I bet you he killed her over money. ...with his soon-to-be ex-wife's death, charging him with two counts of first-degree murder and blaming him for the shooting that took place at her home. With his mugshot showing him as completely unrecognizable to the man we saw on TV just years before. The whole situation is incredibly disturbing, and what makes it even worse is just how beloved Timothy and his family were in their hometown. I mean, they literally had community watch parties to cheer on the family that can still be found here on YouTube. 
That's why, man, it doesn't matter how well you think you know someone. Never allow yourself to be fully secure in another person. It does not matter if they are related to you. It does not matter if they are your best friend. It just, it doesn't matter, man. Always have an open mind that your closest person is going to f*** you over. There's always in the realm of possibility someone backstabbing you. That's basically what I'm trying to say. That is my mentality on things. Do I expect people close to me to do it? No. Do I think they're going to do it? Absolutely not. But if they did do it, I would obviously be upset. But in the very, very back of my mind, I wouldn't be surprised. That's all I'm trying to say. Listen, that was so much fun. I'm so happy and appreciative of the support community. So thanks. Making the event soon to come all the more. I feel like that mentality, you will only have that mentality if it's happened to you. More tragic. And given everything that's happened since the show aired, and since Timothy said this iconic joke, I think it's very possible that there was at least some truth to his words. He's in jail now for putting his wife in a coma. Holy. I mean, I mean, look, man, that's like, what is that expression? Like, keep your friends close, but your enemies closer or some shit like that, man. You know, like, there's a reason why that expression exists. You know what I mean? Our final entry takes on, us to the track. Or keep your friends close, but your enemies closer or something. The... Maritza Martin and okay. <clears throat> FP Pong tries to be the wise tree. No, I'm not. Guys, I'm, shut the f up, man. I'm not trying to be the wise tree. I'm just saying what's coming to my mind, man. Okay. I'm just, I'm just saying, like, I'm not trying to come off as some. All I'm trying to tell you is that my life experiences, that's it. Tree takes us to the tragic passing of 15 year old Yoandra Martin back in November of 1992. The young girl had recently discovered that she was 13 weeks pregnant, much to the disappointment of her family, and subsequently ended her life as a result. Much in 92. The young girl had recently discovered that she was 13 weeks pregnant, much to the disappointment of her family, and subsequently ended her life as a result, which momentarily thrusted her parents, Maritza Martin and Emilio Nunez, into the public eye. The two had been separated since before she was even born, with Maritza gaining full custody, something that Emilio would later claim she had used to keep his daughter away from him, as the two supposedly spent very little time together. As a result, Nunez began publicly blaming Maritza for the death of their daughter, claiming that she and her new husband had been abusive towards her, and it even struck her upon discovering she was pregnant. Making matters worse, Nunez would go on to allege that Maritza never even told him that their daughter had died and had only found out an hour before the funeral from a friend. Now, I want to stress that there is absolutely no information I could find to fully confirm any of what Nunez was claiming, and with many elements of Nunez's story, the jury is still out. Though in his own mind, this truly seems to be what he believed. And this is where the dark side of television began to rear its ugly head. For whatever reason, the news station Okurio Asi had decided to cover Emilio's allegations against Maritza, seemingly taking his word at face value and launching a full-scale story into the case. It started with Emilio being interviewed by a reporter from the station named Ingrid Cruz, which transpired in the vicinity of his daughter's grave. During the questioning, Ingrid would ask him things like, what would you tell your daughter if she was still alive? And how did you feel when you saw your dead daughter in the casket? Jesus. Her questions were clearly crossing the line. Bro, what kind of question is that? How did you feel when you saw your dead daughter in the casket? Line. And things would only get worse from here. Like those type of questions, when I hear that type of question, this is what I actually hear. Ha ha ha. She's dead. What are you going to do about it? That's actually what I hear. When people say shit like that, they're not actually saying what they're saying. They're saying something else. As while they were filming this segment, Maritza herself had arrived on location to Yuandra's final resting place. Doña Maritza. Maritza, me daría una reacción para ocurrió así, por favor, sobre la muerte de su hija Yoandra. Una reacción de usted. Upon her arrival, Nunez immediately removed himself from the situation, and Maritza was instead swarmed by Cruz, who began bombarding her with questions, each of which were ignored, as she clearly was uncomfortable and didn't want to speak to the cameras, and was just trying to get to her daughter's grave. Yeah, that's f man.
It's clear in the footage that tensions were rising by the second, as it seemed apparent that Cruz was clearly attempting to provoke her into any sort of reaction, until suddenly, the unthinkable happened. Su hija tomó esa decisión de quitarse la vida. Usted no tiene nada que decir. In a split second and out of absolutely nowhere, we see Nunez charge back into frame. As though he initially appeared to be doing the responsible thing by walking away from the conflict, he had instead actually returned to his car with the sole purpose of retrieving his pistol, which he would then use to shoot Maritza over and over and over again, Holy all while the camera was still rolling. <laughs> shot a woman possibly coming after us he's psychotic man where am i what funeral home am i at where am i at to be shot <gasps> oh. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> maritza would be shot a total of 12 times and in turn her life would come to an end as nunia stood over her yelling i should have done this a long time ago when the smoke cleared Nunez would be arrested and sentenced to life with a possibility of parole in 25 years. And what's Jesus most frustrating Christ. is just how avoidable this really seemed to be. Maritza herself had actually requested a restraining order against Nunez not long before her murder, but was surprisingly denied, as police stated that it would only anger him more. With this happening to... Wait a minute. She goes to the police to get a restraining order, but they don't give it to her because, no, nah, that's going to make him mad. What in the f kind of logic is that? No, I know restraining orders don't, don't really do anything. They only do something like after the fact, right? So they only do something like after they break the restraining order. So a restraining order really isn't a restraining order. It's a more like, hey, I have this jail ticket that I can turn into the police if you come within X amount of feet. And even then, it doesn't really work that much. But if the mentality is we're not going to give him a restraining order because it's going to make him mad, then that means that he has done some really awful shit. So just go arrest him. It's crazy. Despite the fleet today restraining order against Nunez, not long before her murder, but was surprisingly denied, as police stated that it would only anger him more. With this happening despite the fact that police were already well aware of Nunez's violent temper, as authorities were literally called on scene for Yuandra's funeral, as Nunez had threatened to kill other members of the family. He was obviously a very troubled man. I just feel like if death threats were taken more serious, people wouldn't say them anymore. If someone threatens your life, they should, they should be in jail. There is no reason to threaten another person's life. But this shit like doesn't get taken seriously who following the loss of his daughter needed help <clears throat> more than anything yet even after all this this one news station decided to not only platform him but to provoke him right before the two had crossed paths leaving us with one of the darkest moments to ever transpire in the history of television I just wanted to let you guys know that I have the less sense that was a good of version videos on or Patreon, a good video as YouTube has been that was a good video with my channel lately and also I wanted to mention that my friend Nexpo and I have a joint clothing line and online story called liminal land that we've been working whoa he works with Nexpo yo that's cool I didn't know that that's cool that was a really good video